it's a defense that you're saying the reason you were allegedly negligent was because of the statute. So it's an anticipated defense. In this case, it's the First Amendment. So it just means that the plaintiff's claim is a state claim and has nothing to do with a federal, one of the, it means that the plaintiff's case is a state claim, so it, it's not based on a federal statute, it's not based on the Constitution, it's not based on a treaty. Um, but the defendant defends themselves based on one of those things, meaning based on a statute, based on a treaty, based on a constitutional amendment. It's an anticipated defense. But again, to get the case in federal court based on federal question, it needs to be based on a federal question. It can't be based on a defendant's defense to a lawsuit that's been filed against he or she. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry to see your hand. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> for the wrongful termination, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be like under the <laughs> Federal Civil Rights Act and perhaps state law? So what do you do Yeah, so um, for the Wrongful Termination Act, um, it's your choice. You can bring it based on a state employment law statute or federal Title VII would be in that case. Um, so keep going. So you just make the argument both ways? On, yes, yeah. you just make the argument both ways. So the thing about civil procedure, like pretty much all your law classes with a few exceptions, some of the torts are pretty clear, like assault and battery, um, but it's never quite that cut and dry, meaning typically you can't argue both sides, which is why you need an attorney in there, and then the judge will make the decision. Um, but it's very rare that it's just going to be one of the two. Um, again, not an essay in this class, so starting the first week in April, we'll just be doing practice multiple choice. I just want to make sure you understand the context before you try to do a multiple choice question. If you don't understand the law, you're going to get it wrong. Um, but for future classes, the classes that do have essays, they want you to do what he said, and they want you to have a discussion with them. They want to see that you, and I'll get your hand in just a second, that you've considered all the options in terms of possible claims, counterclaims, different approaches. Yes? Um, this is more kind of general. Um, when we're answering these short answer questions, like I love the way this is set up with the different subheadings, but it's not written like full pretty paragraph style. Like, Is this something that's acceptable to you when we 100 do 100% yes. So if we have short answer, it won't be more than five questions, but I'll limit, like you can only respond in five sentences. So it'll be literally a short answer. <laughs> All right. Cool. Okay, diversity jurisdiction. Um, so we're going to remember we have, it matters what the uh, domicile or citizenship is of the parties, whether it's a plaintiff or defendant. Um, I'm not going to go through and read that whole thing, but essentially um, arguing that uh, the defendant, which again is day school, um, is domiciled in South Carolina um, because it's incorporated in South Carolina. Remember, businesses can have two domiciles, their place of incorporation or where their main operation is. If it's a small business like cute little day school, uh, they're probably going to have their main operations in place of incorporation in the same state. Um, it just depends. Um, and then as far as Patty is concured, uh, the <coughs> obviously is going to argue that Florida is not her domicile um, because she doesn't live there um, and she hasn't lived there for the past five years and for the other reasons that are listed. Um, and the same thing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the domicile because I'm just re reading you the facts that are already in the fact pattern. You can read that on your own. But what's important is in trying to determine um, diversity jurisdiction, you have to figure out their domicile. So you're always going to look at the facts and make uh, your strongest argument for whatever states uh, are mentioned in the fact pattern. Here we have Florida, um, North Carolina, and Georgia. Um, and again, you're looking at um, where they currently reside and their intent to remain indefinitely. So the intent to remain indefinitely is where the argument comes in. Well, do they, does she intend to stay in Florida or Georgia or North Carolina? That's the fuzzy part. Um, that's the not a clear um, cut, clear cut response or answer. So again, in determining domicile for individuals, it's uh, where they reside and where they intend to remain indefinitely, and then the corporations have those two uh, approaches. Um, and whenever we're trying to determine um, diversity jurisdiction, so again, you're looking at the citizenships of the party, which is determined by their domicile, and um, is the amount in controversy um, over $75,000. Here it's $76,000, so the answer is yes. That requirement is met. And then last but not least, you always have to make sure there's complete diversity, which again, it just means no plaintiff or defendant can be domiciled in the same state. And that's it. It's pretty easy. Super easy, to be honest. They actually, well, I won't tell you how easy it is, but it's easy. I was going to say it's part of the street law program, like, so I know that you, they can do it, you can do it. <laughs> They're high school. All right.
so we love subject matter jurisdiction. Cool. Um, before we talk about the cases today, I um, so I'm made, I'm coordinating this program, right? And I need to make sure the room is full uh, because I want it to be successful. Um, it's today from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, it's called Everyone Matters. Um, it's part of the Diversity Committee's uh, <coughs> programming mandate from the, the dean. Um, so I like good food, so it's uh, Mark's Feed. Uh, it's it's uh, pulled chicken, pulled pork, baked beans, potato salad, green beans, brownies, and sweet tea and lemonade. We couldn't afford pop or soda, depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, I will have a civil procedure sign-up sheet. If you come, um, I will add, and it may not sound like a lot, but I will add two points to your final grade. And the reason that matters is if you're on the border between an A and a B, those points matter, because you know how the curve works. At some point, there is a cutoff. Um, if the room is completely full and you can't get in, then sign the sheet, and I'm still gonna give you credit for trying. Um, but 12 to one today in this room. Yes, I'm desperate. Bing. Okay, so. Professor, I think yes. we get out of contract at 12.05 and we be... Of course, yeah. late as you want to be, because come on. I'll have the sign-up sheet right there taped to that table. Yeah, pie. He wants the pie. <laughs> <laughs> but the food might be, you know, it's going to, yeah. you know that is, but I know you can't. Who's, who do you have for contracts? Paul. Oh, he's, he, he doesn't love me. He likes me. I would be like, I'll tell him to let you out early. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Tabitha, are you ready today? Yes. Um, Oh, you still look flustered. Why? <coughs> huh? Oh, I'm just going back to Iqbal because I had read for. So Tabitha, we're not. We're, I'm not going to ask you any Iqbal questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the only reason I'm asking you today is because you had the traffic issues last time, and so we really didn't get to. Yeah, no, you're yeah. fine. Okay, yeah, so I'm no Iqbal. <laughs> yeah, you look flustered. I'm like, please don't be. It's like nice chi environment, right? It should be by now. Come on, you're almost done with the semester. You're two L's, basically. Um, one L's in the flesh, two L's in the mind. All right. Um, so, my jokes are just not going well today. <laughs> it's too early. I'm okay with that. I don't take it first. We'll laugh later. I'm going into competition this afternoon. Oh, that's exciting. To me, I'm competitive. Um, are we upset about the Louisville basketball game? Nope. Oh, yeah, the lady cards are still in it. Um, did who was the what was the Cinderella team? Murray State for a minute. Woo! <laughs> did you go to Murray State? Yeah. Okay. I hope so. Um, screaming like that. Don't you? <laughs> so who's left? UK. Oregon. The Sparks are still in it. Yeah. All right, go green. Anybody else? There's more. It's got to be at least. Are we into the final four yet? Or no? Oh, no. Sweet 16. <laughs> Sorry, first of all, I'm a college football person, so I watch basketball. Oh, Florida State's still in it. Yeah, I know that. So, no, no, what Mark Madness is. Virginia Trust me. Tech, okay. yeah. Florida State, Tennessee, yes. LSU, Michigan State, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon uh, Houston. Is Oregon a wild card? Yeah, they're like, they're low. They're yeah, like so low. would they be considered the Cinderella team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I like when it's a smaller school, like a Murray State. I love those. That's what gets me all excited. I'm like, oh. I was looking for Wofford. To what? <laughs> all righty. All right, so um, we left off with the last class um, talking about the Iqbal case um, in Standard 8A2. Um, the rule of law from Iqbal, just as a reminder, um, is that in deciding when to grant uh, defendants uh, 12B6 um, motion to dismiss, um, again, which challenges the plaintiff's failure to satisfy Rule 8A2. The court will use the new standard, which is the plausibility standard, um, meaning the plaintiff's complaint um, must allege facts that plausibly support, meaning it's more plausible, it's likely to have occurred, um, the plaintiff's claim such that the court can make a reasonable inference that the defendant is liable. So again, the plausibility standard requires um, that the plaintiff's complaint um, must allege facts, not legal conclusions. So must allege facts, not legal conclusions, that plausibly support the plaintiff's claim 
such that the court can make a reasonable inference that the defendant is liable. Reasonable inference. All right, um, so our next chapter, Chapter 6, I believe, um, deals with additional pleading requirements that are required for certain types of cases. Um, in addition to the general plausibility standard that we saw in the Iqbal case, um, there's also some additional pleading requirements depending on what type of case it is. Um, so we're going to cover the Stratford case um, because it highlights um, some of these special rules under Rule 9. Um, and so today, oh, I wish I had my list keeps disappearing. So um, we've got Attorney Douglas. And uh, we have, um, I've already called it. Have I called on you Attorney Walsh yet? Yes. Awesome. Uh, have I called on you Attorney, I think I've gotten everybody almost, yay. Um, Bearden? Sorry. All right, so Bearden it is. Douglas Bearden. And since we have a lot of cases today, um, what about attorney Healy? I'm right here, I was called on first class. All right, you want to make sure you emphasize <laughs> first class. <laughs> like how so not. But remember you did really well though. That was that really hard case, so you should be happy about that. Because um, I, I, I did not do well in that case in law school. I didn't understand it. You want to be, you volunteer to be Tribune? I did. That's no fun because the whole point is you're supposed to know you're prepared. That takes away the... Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so we've got Douglas Bearden and... Um, Kent. Baxter, if I've called on you? Yeah, you've already called on me. Okay, so I think I've almost gotten everyone, so I'll finish up the last few weeks. All right, let's go then. Bearden and Douglas. Um, which of you are kind enough to give me the facts, please? I can. Thank uh, you. Dr. Stratford is a dentist who maintains an office in Staten Island, New York. Um, he failed to pay the required insurance premiums for his building, and they and uh, Northern canceled the policy from October 10th, 1999, to December 13th, 1999. And then December 6th of the same year, Dr. Stratford submitted a no claims letter, meaning that he had no reason to use the insurance um, until October 19th. And uh, on December 14th, 1999, he was notified by the insurance company that <coughs> the coverage would be canceled. Uh, oh, never mind, sorry, wrong date. He was notified of reinstating it on January 9th, 2000. And then 10 days later, he made this huge claim on leaking in his building and his equipment being damaged and so forth. Okay, excellent job. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight what she said um, to make sure everybody heard it. Um, thank you for being detailed with the dates because they are relevant. Um, so this dentist we know is super shady, right? He's trying to get away with some insurance fraud. Um, and it's so ironic because I have a family member um, who uh, got mad at um, his wife, right, and called the insurance company to separate their um, insurance policy. They each have a car, and he, and he said, I want it separated. Um, we're separated. Didn't tell her. Um, and so then if they ended up, you know, I guess he thought he was going to leave and decided that he was going to stay, but he forgot that he'd separated the policy, and he had it going to a friend's house, the new policy, and so he got what? Ran from the back on his birthday, brand new 2019 truck, and he called, got a police report, called the insurance company, you know, just not even thinking, because the, because I'm like, how could you not realize that you hadn't, good morning, got your, that's okay, I got your, okay, um, I'm like, how did you? How did he not know he wasn't paying the bill? And she said, oh, it's been an automatic withdrawal, you know, out of debit. And he thought he did, but he didn't. And so 
he called to make the claim with State Farm. They're like, you haven't been covered. He did it November 15 um, since then. You, you, I mean, January. So the accident happened March 8th. And so he lies and says, I never canceled my policy. Da -da 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 -da. So State Farm calls my cousin, the girl, and she's like, they left a message. What should I do? Like, you know, she's like, I didn't even know that he was planning on leaving me. She's like, should I? So now she wants to like screw him over, right? <laughs> um, but yet they're in this happy space. So she's just like, she's all confused. And she's like, I got to call them back. And so, you know, the insurance company called her and she said, um, did you can't, did you separate the policies? Well, no. Um, did you know they were separated? No. Okay, so it wasn't, it wasn't your intention. So she didn't lie, because it's insurance fraud. And that's all they asked her and she hung up. So now they're trying to decide the underwriters, you know, basically he's saying it was a mistake. I never said to do that. Um, and you, why would you do that? I, I mean, we're married. Why would I split the policy up? And they said, we have here in our notes, the customer service rep that took the call that you asked for because you said you were getting separated. You were separated from your wife at the time. So it'll be interesting to see what State Farm does. Um, I feel like this, like this shady doctor, he's outside the claim, period. Um, and it's, you know, don't, don't do the coverage. And so this dentist is like the shady cousin's husband. Um, he basically um, allowed a policy covering his business premise to lapse. Um, when the weather turned uh, poorly, the pipes in his office, um, as Attorney Douglas stated, uh, burst um, and damaged mo most of his office, including some really, really expensive dental implants. And so he responded by asking the insurer to renew the policy, again, offering written assurance that, listen, during the lapse, there's been no type of damage or incidents that have happened. And then, of course, right after the policy is renewed, Shady Dentist files a claim alleging that the damage occurred a month earlier than it actually had within the time period in which um, he was covered under the policy. Um, and really what went really south here in this particular scenario is that the dentist made a very bad tactical area, era excuse me, by upping his claim, as Attorney Douglas alluded to, from $150,000 in property damage to more than a million. And you don't think that's going to wave a red flag? Are you kidding me? Um, and allegedly lost profits. So surprisingly, the insurer paid, I would have, um, but with this interest apparently peaked by the larger uh, claim, me meaning over a million dollars, um, they continue to investigate um, the situation to see whether or not um, they should have just claimed coverage. Um, so who sued first, um, Attorney Beard and Where are you? Um, the um, Excellent, yes. Um, so, Denton Strafford um, sued in state court, I believe it was 1.2 million. Um, why did the insurance, what did the insurance company do once it sued? And then I'll go back to Attorney Douglas. Um, once uh, he sued, the defendants removed the action to federal court while several counties. Excellent, okay. So, um, once the insurance, uh, what the insurance company did in response to the dentist, the plaintiff suing them, is they counterclaim for fraud. They're like, screw you, this is fraud, we're not paying the money. Um, and they sought to recover the amount already paid, plus punitive damages. They wanted to make an example out of him, you know, for trying to uh, fraudulently, fraudulently get this claim uh, paid for. Um, so what did the den dentist do next, um, Attorney Douglas? What type of motion did he file? So because you didn't brief, we're waiting on you to find it in the book. Yes, I'm assuming? I book briefed. I didn't get that part, though. We'll just wait on our attorney, Bearden. So again, Stratford moved to what type of motion did, they, did he file in response to the insurance company's counter? Uh, stated that they used Rule 9B and said that they failed to identify the lie that he had made. Very good. Okay, so um, he filed a motion to dismiss the counterclaim. They're like, hey, 
He's like, throw this claim out, Your Honor, um, because they, this claim again for fraud, because they failed to proper, properly apply Rule 9B, meaning they failed to plead the fraud with the necessary specificity, right, um, required by Rule 9B. So I have behind me um, what Rule 9B requires. Essentially, um, it says, in alleging fraud or mistake, a party must state with particularity, so you have to give greater detail. You can't just be broad and say, oh, there was a fraud claim. Um, the circumstances constituting the fraud or mistake. Malice, intent, um, knowledge, and other conditions of a person's mind may be alleged generally, but the fraud, you have to be very specific about what fraud you're alleging occurred. Um, so there are essentially two parts to Rule 9b. Um, the first part being that for fraud claims, you must plead with particularity the specific circumstances which constitute the fraud, so again, the first part of 9B is that you must plead with particularity these specific circumstances which constitute fraud. One last time, the first step for Rule 9B is to plead with particularity the specific circumstances which constitute the fraud. And second, you can allege malice and knowledge generally. So it doesn't have to be specific. You can allege malice and knowledge generally. Um, according to the court, what does the first sentence in 9b mean? Um, I think it's on the last paragraph on page 404. According to the court, what does the first sentence in 9b mean? Meaning the circumstances surrounding the fraud must plead. It requires the time, place, and nature of the alleged misrepresentations. Excellent. So we like that because it's telling us what it means instead of being all vague. So it just means you have to state, as they stated, the time, place, and nat nature of the alleged representations. Um, in applying that standard to the facts, what does the court conclude about the defendant's counterclaim then, Attorney Douglas? And we'll go back to Attorney Bearden after that. Uh, they said it was insufficient under Rule 9b and had to be dismissed, but they gave them a period of time to amend the complaint. Now you're back in rock star mode. You worried me. I was like, she's going to make me be an ASS, and I don't want to be. Because uh, I need to know you're prepared. Excellent, excellent response. All right. So we know the court says um, that the defendant's counterclaim simply failed to identify a statement um, by the shady doctor <laughs> that they claim to be false. Thus, it's unclear from the face of the counterclaims whether the defendants asserted that Dr. Stratford's claim losses were improperly inflated, inflated or that the office was never flooded or not during the term of the policy. So they're like, we need to know what specific fraud is. It all three, but you need to state in the counterclaim with specificity what particular fraud happened, the time, place, and manner. So they really didn't emphasize the manner or the time. So it just wasn't clear enough. Um, and as a reminder, the court says that Rule 9 is there. The reason we have it um, is to provide the dentist, even though he's shady, um, Dr. Stratford, um, with fair notice of precisely which statement or which aspect of the claim they're saying uh, is fraudulent. Okay, because again, they're, the reason of point for Rule 9 is number one, to help weed out frivolous fraud cases to not overwhelm the docket, and B, if you're being accused of fraud, I need to know specific enough specificity so I know how to defend myself, right? Um, Attorney Bearden, what does the court say about the de defendant's complaint in the, in the second sentence um, in Rule 9b, um, which is the top of 405? What do they say? Well, they basically say that um, as to the second part of Rule 9b, it uh, does be sufficient. Okay, I think you're perfect. Let's say it one more time. We're almost done. Um, basically, that the second part of Rule 9b, um, the complaint is sufficient. Excellent. And it's sufficient why? because it states that a fraud has occurred. Excellent job. All right, so the court says the defendant's counterclaim um, succeeds in alleging that the facts, quote, and this is directly from your text, give rise to a strong inference of fraudulent intent. Um, the timing, they said, of Dr. Stratford's claim, again, just 10 days after the policy was reinstated, um, his alleged refusal to cooperate with the insurance company's investigation, 
and the size of the claim from 150,000 to 1.2 million um, is, is enough to satisfy that uh, requirement um, for Rule 9. Um, so in terms of the court's holding, uh, we know that the court in this case agreed um, that the counterclaim, again, was not sufficiently specific, um, but they basically just gave the um, insure, insurance company's lawyer um, a brief lesson on how to fix the problem um, and granted them uh, leave to amend uh, the, the counterclaim leaving Stratford without his dental implants and facing a very long and unpleasant litigation ahead of him with a predictably bad outcome. So uh, when the, the court essentially is saying, look, we're acknowledging that you did not follow 9B in terms of your counterclaim for fraud, um, but we're not going to just totally throw you out there on a limb. We're going to say, you know what, go back, fix it refile and we can move on with the litigation. So it's not trying to screw people over that have legitimate claims, meaning the application of Rule 9b. It's just trying to make sure the process is fair so that even though Dr. Stratford is shady, that's for the jury to decide. He has the right to defend himself and he needs to know with specificity uh, the time, place, and manner of the claim so he knows how to prepare a, an efficient or sufficient rather defense. Um, so does Rule 9, do we like Rule 9? I do. Like, even if I'm being shady, it's kind of like everyone has the right to counsel. Like, I still want to know how, um, what I should be defending myself from. And I don't want any, you know, I want to be prepared as possible. So that's all Rule 9 is doing for us today. All right. Um, the next topic that Chapter 6 deals with um, is allocating elements of the claim. Okay, so allocating elements of the claim. Um, so, so far we've essentially assume two things um, in this class. Um, that we or the court knew the elements of each claim, or kind of claim, and we've assumed basically that the plaintiff uh, had the responsibility for pleading those particular claims. And we've assumed that because if you're the plaintiff bringing the lawsuit, and I'm assuming that you are responsible for pleading or arguing what the claims are, uh, the different elements. So. Um, Interestingly enough, Chapter 6 tells us that none of those two assumptions are necessarily, neither of those two assumptions are necessarily always true. Sometimes the court is not sure who has the burden of pleading particular elements of a claim. Um, but how does that relate then to uh, Rule 8A2, right? Um, who has the burden in proving the elements of the claim can also impact whether or not the party has fulfilled 8A2. Um, Remember that 882 requires the party to provide a short, plain statement um, showing that you're entitled to relief. And a part of that showing that you're entitled to relief is making sure you plead and address the specific elements of each claim that you're asserting. Um, so the Jones v. Block case, which we will cover next, um, basically addresses the issue of who uh, bears the burden of proof um, are rather proving different parts of a claim and how that impacts 8A2. So again, we are reading the Jones v. Block case because it tells us who bears the burden of pleading uh, different parts of a claim and how that burden impacts our 8A2 analysis. All right? Okay, so you did great with the facts last time, so do you mind giving us the facts, Attorney Douglas? No problem. <coughs> Lorenzo Jones was a prisoner held in Michigan prison he suffered an injury while he was in custody and asked to be relocated to a job that would not aggravate his injuries, but the staff refused to reassign him and told him, do the work or suffer the consequences. So he did the required tasks and it ended up aggravating his injuries. So uh, he sued under 42 USC section 1983 and uh, his case was consolidated with other complaints that were similar. Excellent job. All right, so um, the issue then in this case um, is that she stated the court consolidated um, this case with several others to decide who had the burden of pleading, exhaustion of administrative remedies, as required by, again, this newly enacted uh, Prison Litigation Reform Act, um, which, again, requires exhaustion um, of administrative remedies, but does not address who has the burden of, can't talk, burden of pleading. 
Um, so a quick side note on the exhaustion of administrative remedies. So several federal statutes will require that you exhaust your administrative remedies before you can file your case in federal court. So for instance, the EEOC, Equal um, Employment Opportunity Commission. So if I am here at U of L, if I feel like I've been discriminated against because of my gender on the job, I didn't get tenure because I'm a girl, and they don't want any more women uh, tenured faculty members here, right? Um, I can't just go and file a case in federal court. I can go and file a case in state court anytime I want. But federal court is probably going to give me a little bit more bang for my buck for a couple of reasons. One, state court, local, localized. They're not trying to, you know, they love U of L. It provides a lot of employment uh, for the city. Um, the judge who's going to be hearing my case is going to be caring about re-election. If there's a big lawsuit in favor of me where the university has to pay me out, that might be, not be looked upon favorably. Um, I want to go to federal court with that issue, right? And so um, in doing so, I have to, if I want to file my claim under Title VII, well, which is an employment discrimination statute, I have to first exhaust my administrative remedies with that at my place of employment. Um, so that means I have to go through the EEOC first. That's exhaustion of your administrative remedies. And I have to um, let them do their investigation you know, and they're going to ask me, did you file a grievance at your place of employment? Yes. Did you go through their process? Yes. You know, they said they, that's not why I didn't get tenure, but they're lying. So the EEOC will do an investigation, and then they'll give me a right to sue letter. That right to sue letter, I can then go to any attorney here and say, I'd like to file my case in federal court, and they're going to ask me, do you have a right to sue letter from the EEOC? Or did you exhaust, did you go through the EEOC's process? Meaning, did you exhaust your administrative remedies? And I'll say yes, they'll file the case in federal court. Now, I can exhaust my administrative remedies through the EEOC and still not get that right to sue letter and still file my case in federal court. But the point is, the idea is it's kind of another <laughs> gatekeeping mechanism, another layer that you have to go through. And what the hope is behind including that requirement in statutes is that, you know, we'll handle stuff here and we won't have to go to federal court. Meaning my job will say, oh, we don't need a lawsuit. Let's go ahead and rethink this or they'll offer me a settlement. So again, it's just another way of trying to minimize the amount of cases that are actually going to federal court if they can be settled and handled um, at a lower level. Um, most employment law attorneys are gonna want that right to sue letter because it's basically kind of a stamp of approval. They're like, well, if the EEOC says they have a valid claim, let's go. But if the EEOC looked into it and said, eh, it's very hard to get a lawyer to say, okay, yeah, I'll take your case. Um, but you could always, find someone if you're willing to pay them I guess all right so that's what they they mean by this exhaustion of administrative remedies and so the issue that the court has to decide in this case is does the plaintiff have to provide facts in the complaint that it has exhausted its administrative remedies or is it an affirmative defense who can tell me what an affirmative defense is yes an affirmative defense is a defense that the um, so the defendant has the burden of proving. They have to prove that it's actually what's the issue, what the case is. Absolutely textbook perfect, yes. Um, so <coughs> that's the question. Sorry, I threw me off a little bit because you were so precise. So yes, the plaintiff has to prove, so the, the uh, can't talk today. The court is trying to decide whether the plaintiff has to provide facts, again, in the complaint um, that it has exhausted its administrative remedies or um, is it a, that an affirmative defense that the defendant needs to allege in their answer? Hey, they're trying to, the defendant would say, hey, their plaintiff just filed this case against me. They haven't even exhausted their administrative remedies. They haven't fulfilled that requirement of the act. So I need you to dismiss this case, Your Honor. Um, so what specifically, Attorney Bearden, does the exhaustion provision of the Prison Litigation Reform Act provide? Um, I think it's. So what specific exhaustion remedy does it provide? I think it's on page 411. And take your time. No, it's on 410, yeah. Uh, it says that no action shall be brought with respect to prison conditions under 42 U.S.C. section 1983 or any other federal law by prisoners confined in any jail, prison, or other correctional facility until such administrative remedies are, as are available are exhausted. Perfect. And what does the court say is the purpose behind this Prison Litigation Reform Act? Why do we even have it? Uh, basically, they just don't want to flood the courts with uh, prison litigation. Excellent. All right. So, yeah. So, basically, just to address the large number of prison um, litigation 
complaints filed in federal court. Um, to that end, um, Congress basically enacted a variety um, of reforms, again, designed to help filter um, out some of the bad claims and facilitate a smoother process for uh, legitimate claims. And so um, the key among, one of the key features among these efforts by Congress um, was the requirement that inmates complaining about prison conditions, again, exhaust um, pris their prison grievance remedies um, before initiating a lawsuit. Because you know every prisoner, not every, but most of them be like, I'm being treated poorly, you know, so they're like, we just want the legitimate claims here. Um, so requiring exhaustion basically allows uh, prison officials um, an opportunity to resolve disputes concerning the exercise um, of their responsibilities uh, before being hauled into court. Um, this has to potentially reduce the number of inmate suits and also to improve the quality of suits that are filed. Um, who in here has seen the movie? It's super old. It's okay if you don't know what it is, but Shawshank Redemption. Oh, no way. That's so cool. Isn't that like such a cool old movie? Like, I love it. The end. It, every time I do this case, I think about Shawshank and how he totally screws the, um, the warden over. But the, you can see why this Prison Litigation Reform Act is trying to keep out um, illegitimate claims so that ones like we saw that were obviously very legitimate in Shawshank Redemption can actually get to the court system. All right, so the court's holding in this case was what, Attorney Douglas, in reasoning? Uh, they said that most courts view failure to exhaust as an affirmative defense, and because claims covered under the PLRA are typically brought under a statute which does not require exhaustion at all, they found that uh, they that it would be uh, beneficial to go with the majority of courts on this case, and that the defendant would have to prove that they had exhausted all of the other avenues. Excellent, excellent, and excellent. Um, so, any questions about this case? Any questions? Pretty clear cut? Yes. I just want to make sure I got the, that I have the holding down correctly. So they ruled, they ruled that the burden of proof for failing to exhaust administ administrative remedies is on, that's, to defend, that's for the defendants to prove, that's for the prison officials to prove. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Moving forward. You look so fun today. Attorney. It's the material, not me, so I'm not offended. All right, um, so moving right along, we're doing really well. Um, the last section covered um, is ethical limitations and pleading. So you're seeing all these exceptions to that initial, initial Rule 8A. So ethical limitations and pleading. And so um, Rule 11A provides, as you see there, and attorney. Olivia, is it Rick Swamp? Will attest that I will send this PowerPoint to you. She asked for it a little bit early, um, meaning with all this stuff in it. So if you see me moving along, I'll send the PowerPoint. I just wanted to get through today's class so that we could get through all the cases before I sent it out. Uh, but Rule 11A um, provides that every pleading, uh, motion, and paper filed in federal court must be signed by an attorney of record or if a party is not represented by a lawyer, then by that party. Okay, does anyone know what <coughs> Rule 11B provides? Can someone tell me what Rule 11B provides? Voila! It's long, that's why I'm emailing it to you. All right, so Rule 11B um, basically says that an attorney um, or the unrepresented party certifies um, that allegations made in the complaint were formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances and that to that person's best knowledge, the information and belief that one, the complaint is not being presented for any improper purpose, such as to harass, um, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. Two, when you sign that complaint, you're uh, asserting that the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law and is not a frivolous argument. And then three, the factual contentions have evidentiary support. And then four, that the denials of factual um, contentions are warranted on the evidence or specifically so identified are reasonably based on belief or lack of information. So the whole purpose of Rule 11 is to, to promote a litigation environment where you have ethical pleadings. Don't plead, you know, frivolous, crappy 
stuff just to get the case in court because you're trying to harass your ex because you're mad at them when you know that it's really you got them hiring an attorney wasting their time when you know it's not a legitimate lawsuit that you're filing so rule 11 is trying to hold you accountable and what they will do is if if you're found in violation the judge can say you know what you're going to pay for the other party's attorney fees for wasting the court's time and we're going to give you a fine for wasting our time to court and you're going to pay their attorney fees um, so rule 11 is there to try to again weed out frivolous pointless inauthentic unauthentic rather lawsuits um, and then lastly, there's 11 C as in cat. C as in cat. Oh, it's there. It is. Yay, the sanctions I was mentioning. <coughs> All right. Um, provides that after notice and opportunity to respond, uh, the court will determine um, that Rule 11 B has been violated, and then they can impose um, some of the sanctions that I mentioned before. Um, so essentially what happens is, um, a party seeking sanctions um, will give notice to the other party um, that look, if you don't change this or if you don't drop this lawsuit, I'm gonna seek, seek sanctions. Um, so you basically give a copy of that motion to the defendant and you give a, uh, a copy in, in court, excuse me, um, and then you wait 21 days. And if they don't withdraw the complaint, the plaintiff, ooh, did y'all just hear something go quiet? Are you guys joking with me or you didn't hear like a buzzing sound stop? So I look crazy. Okay. I still hear a, I still hear a buzzing. So what just happened when I was talking to you so you all don't start a rumor that I'm like, I'm, I'm rattling here. <laughs> but while I was talking to you, it sounded like when you're on the airplane and then your ears unpop. And so all of a sudden I went from like tunnel to this clarity and I was like, did y'all hear that? So that's what happened, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, so basically Rule 11, all I care about, I don't care about the, you knowing the number of days, because you can look that up in the statutory book when you're attorneys. It's 21 days you have to respond before, if you don't, then the judge will look at the motion and make a ruling. Um, I care about you know that that 11C are the sanctions that can be asserted if you violate 11A or B. Let's go ahead and talk about the Walker case. We are doing so well, we're right on time. I'm happy, happy, happy. Um, Attorney Bearden, let's try you with the facts. So, um, if you speak over a lot of trust fund, uh, Maybe, I'm going to reframe that. Just tell me the basis of the lawsuit for the sake of time. Okay. Yeah, um, sorry about that. Basically, what's Walker claiming? Um, Walker's claiming that um, they breached their fiduciary duty and other state law causes of action against the uh, Norwood Company and numerous individual officers and employees. Excellent. All right, you're doing a. I mean, like, judicial job, like Judge Bearden level, just rock star. Do you like the content in the class? It's okay if you don't. Uh, yeah, I like it because it's like group based almost. I kind of like. Yeah. So you're gonna do corporate? I, I don't really know, but uh, I'll work at CPA from right now. So. Oh, but that makes sense. Cause I hated the class as a student. I like it now because I'm on the other side, but I didn't like it. I didn't. Under, I just thought it was. It was too vague in the beginning, so I lost interest and never kind of checked back in. So we know the basis of the lawsuit, you know, because Pernoyer, I'm like, what is that? Like, what is that crap? And I just checked out until the end. Um, the basis for the lawsuit is he stated plaintiff. Um, Walker claimed that the defendant bank and its officers had, as he stated, improperly handled the trust fund, so they breached their fiduciary duty. Uh, the plaintiff and his guardian, which is going to be Cynthia Walker, are both South Dakota residents, um, and the defendant, Northwest Corporations, um, is a Minnesota corporation. So far, that means that we are good on diversity jurisdiction. Yay, we like that. Um, so what then is wrong with the plaintiff's complaint? Uh, they said that the plaintiff and some of the defendants are citizens of different states. Yes, so they're implying that on the face of the complaint that there's no complete diversity, right? They're saying, hey, wait a minute, diversity is incomplete. Um, some of the defendants were also South Dakota residents, and so was the plaintiff. So they're, that's what's going on here. So they're saying you're being unethical. You're trying to file a case in federal court based on subject matter jurisdiction, and there's not diversity of citizenship amongst the parties. So what does the defendant do when he realizes that there's something wrong with the plaintiff's complaint? Um, he does what every defendant would do. The uh, defendant pounced on that basic first-year student mistake. Um, and sent the plaintiff a letter asking him to withdraw the complaint or you face sanctions. Um, so there's a student I used to have come and speak, but he's been too busy this semester, but I'm still begging him. His name is uh, Rudy 
Oh, I forgot Rudy's last name. Ellis. Rudy Ellis, thank you. Um, Rudy loves to tell a story his first year um, in practice that he found a complaint that someone um, filed and realized that they didn't have diversity jurisdiction. He's like, are you serious? He thought it was a trick because it was too easy. So he went ahead and filed a motion for sanctions and the person's like, screw you, there is diversity jurisdiction. He's like, no, there's not. And so he went before the court and argued that they were really the plaintiff and one of the defendants were residents of Kentucky because their intent to remain indefinitely was here in Kentucky. And he won. He's like, I won. He's like, and this is like an older, an older attorney. And he's like, I totally won the motion. So he loves to tell the story. He tells it better because he lived it, but um, it does happen. Um, so we know the uh, plaintiff's response um, to the defendant saying, you know, withdraw the complaint or face sanctions. Um, is after the plaintiff's attorney, uh, Massey, failed to offer any explanation for the defective issues in the complaint, um, the defendant, um, Northwest, moved to dismiss under Rule 12b-1, um, lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Um, and so, uh, what does the court do then? So I had mentioned those rules 12, Rule 12, and we will spend a class talking about them, but Rule 12 are different reasons, again, that you can um, do a motion for dismiss, whether it's here is lack of subject matter jurisdiction, lack of personal jurisdiction, um, and so on. And so um, the district court basically said, look, uh, we're going to grant um, the 12B1 motion to dismiss and sanctions. So they put, they gave sanctions to Attorney Macy under Federal Rule 11 uh, of a total amount of $4,800 in fees and expenses. Um, so the Walkers and Attorney Macy appealed the decision. Um, Attorney Bearden, what did the plaintiffs do wrong in this case? What did the plaintiffs do wrong? Basically, they just uh, didn't understand what, that it required complete diversity of jurisdiction. And furthermore, what else did they do wrong, attorney? Wow, well, having a moment. Don't say your name. Douglas. Uh, they didn't look into it at all to see where everybody was from. Um, What's the biggest thing they didn't do outside of look into it? Once they were put on notice, what didn't they do? Oh, they didn't yeah. even change it. Yeah, they, they, they acknowledged it. it, but didn't change it. Yes, 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 yes. So they brought the complaint on his face, on his face, suggesting again this absence of um, this is what the plaintiffs did wrong, absence of jurisdiction, and then they failed to correct the mistake when it was brought to their attention. <coughs> Who does that? That is like ridiculous. And so, um, what could the plaintiffs have done to correct the problem? It would have been really easy just to drop one of the individual defendants, right, and add them when. Um, you know, they saw it as desirable. So they could have dropped one of the defendants to create complete diversity. And I know this is kind of like manipulative, but you can always add them later on after the suit has, well, that's Civ Pro too, but you can be sneaky and kind of add them as an additional defendant later on. <laughs> or they can intervene on their own via Rule 24 because if, if the outcome of the case is gonna affect them personally. So if you have a co-business partner, let them intervene later on rule to, via Rule 24 to get in the case, even though it's gonna destroy diversity. There's like all these exceptions, but just know that it's, that's why it's a chess game, and it's like who's who's gonna outsmart the other person. So it's a lot of st strategy involved until you get to um, the actual jury to view the case. All right. So what section of Rule 11 did the plaintiffs' counsel violate? Um, it's gonna be Section 11B1. I don't think I put on the slide. It's gonna be Section 11B1. Yeah. So that's what section. Um, <laughs> that was violated. Um, section 11B2, um, excuse me, that's the section that was violated. So it says, under, the, under that provision, counsel has obligated to do enough research to know um, that the diversity jurisdiction alleged in the complaint required complete diversity. Um, 11B2, as you have behind me, provides that the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or by a non-frivolous argument. So this claim, um, of diversity jurisdiction was not warranted by existing law because existing law requires that the plaintiffs and the defendants uh, be domiciled in different states. So it's 11B2 um, is the section of Rule 11 uh, that the plaintiff's counsel uh, violated. Um, it's also probably a violation of 11B3, right? Um, to continue to advocate for diversity jurisdiction when the plaintiff's counsel became aware he had no evidentiary support um, for citizenship of some of the parties. And the evidence that um, he did indicate that some of the defendants were residing in South Dakota. 
So he could easily point to nothing other than a hope and a prayer at this point um, that these defendants would turn out to be diverse to the plaintiffs. So he basically had no evidentiary basis from the beginning um, to believe that the allegation of diversity was likely to have evidentiary support. Um, so again, 11B3 could apply as well because he continued to advocate um, for this diversity jurisdiction even though it was brought to his attention um, that there really wasn't a strong basis for that. Um, so we're on appeal here in either Attorney Douglas or Bearden. Um, what were Attorney Macy's and the plaintiff's arguments on appeal? Because they're still kind of ticked off. Thank you. They tried to say that they shouldn't have had to go through all the effort that would have required, even though it wasn't much effort. <laughs> <laughs> and they also tried to argue that they didn't have the money to pay the sanctions and that the plaintiff never argued for sanctions, so why were they getting them? All right. And Attorney Burden, excellent everything. Do you have anything to add? If not, that is cool. All right, so we have um, essentially what they're saying on appeal, and I'm just going to highlight some of the stuff that Attorney Douglas said. Um, that Rule 11, um, essentially they're like, look, it doesn't require this kind of um, complicated, in-depth um, analysis. And it's, they said it, it's possibly, um, you know, they just didn't think it was necessary to have to dig that deep um, for the defendant's citizenship before filing the complaint. That's a really weak argument. Um, they also said they felt that the district court abused its discretion um, in awarding monetary sanctions um, since dismissal of the complaint would have been adequate. So why are you giving us sanctions? Just dismiss the complaint, but you, we don't have the money and you're now going to make us pay $4,800. Just throw the complaint out. Um, they said the court should have inquired into the attorney's financial situation. They would have known they didn't have $4,800 to pay. That second argument, isn't that ridiculous? That is goofy. So I'm supposed to inquire me so to inquire to your financial situation to see no if you break the rules i'm going to apply the sanctions but that's their argument um and they said that the district court uh, based its discretion in denying their request to amend the complaint abused its discretion uh, when they said you know what we're not going to allow you to amend the complaint now remember in the previous case the court was a lot nicer and said you know what we're going to allow you to amend that 9b in, um insufficient part of the complaint and then you can move on but here they're like this is so basic and this is like the basic due diligence that attorneys should do we're not even gonna let you we're, just, we're not even gonna let you amend the case like this is ridiculous um, yes yes 100% so she asked a great question could this be considered malpractice yes the, the plaintiff could bring this up uh, through the ABA and this person could possibly get disbarred because that's they've just gotten screwed because of the attorneys um, Inadequacies or insufficiencies. Well, yeah, and I was just going to say, like, one of my favorite quotes from this case is, the district court is not obliged to do Massey's research for him, especially <laughs> at such a late date. I love that. But it, Massey says, yes, you should. <laughs> you should be my, my legal clerk, right? And that's a great quote. I'm glad you said that. Um, so we know the court uh, responds uh, to these arguments, these very weak arguments, um, in saying that the plaintiffs are basically arguing um, that finding out the defendant's citizenship would be more trouble than they should be expected to take on. However, the court says that this is the burden uh, of the plaintiffs that are desiring, again, to invoke diversity jurisdiction. That's your job as an attorney, essentially. As to the attorney's inability to pay the sanctions, uh, the court says that the attorney failed to argue that point to the district court, and there's no record or evidence to support that argument. Um, I don't even think they should be able to argue they can't pay the sanctions because I think it's a good deterrence for you not to do that if you know you're going to get sanctions regardless of whether or not you can afford to pay them. I Don't break the rules. It's kind of like if you don't want to go to jail, don't, don't run the red light, you know, unless you're me. Um, just kidding. I don't run red lights. Those are, that's bad. Um, meaning I don't want to die. <laughs> But yeah, so um, the district court, they basically said they're not obligated, as Attorney Douglas said, to do the plaintiff's research or lawyering for them. Um, so the court says no abuse of discretion um, and upholds the district court's decision against the plaintiff. Awesome. Um, we've done really well. So like we're like on schedule. We are seven minutes ahead of schedule. I'm so excited about today. Um, <coughs> And that's it. So tomorrow is Tuesday. So we will continue on um, with our discussion. Um, and I think that's it. I'll see you soon. Bye. Oh, the attendance sheet. Where is it? I got it. Okay. You can leave it there. I'll come get it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I am if you are. Yes. I was
go then. Because prisoners already don't have books. Yes. So you're taking. It's in the notes. Do like you mean? 